the overview of Pilot, its features, uh, give you an idea of what it can and can't do, how it's organized. Um, this is all generally in the manual, but of course the manual is quite long. Um, so even if you've read the manual, may, you may not have caught all of the uh, important things that uh, you sh hopefully you learned if you would have read the manual thoroughly. Um, but we also recognize that maybe not everyone opened the manual, um, but you're here anyway and you want to learn. So we want to get you started. Um, so uh, Pilot uh, is developed by Matt Charles and I. Um, it combines the dynamic modeling capabilities of a code I wrote as part of my thesis um, called EQ Sim with quasi static modeling capabilities of Tekton, which Charles has worked on sort of way back, starting with his thesis. Um, and the idea was that both of those were generally developed without a whole lot of influence from the computational science discipline. So with CIG's help, we have uh, attempted to uh, significantly improve the software engineering aspects of the code and really make it an open source community code that is modular in design, uh, integrates testing, has documentation, um, is distributed easily, um, and Pilot version 1.0 was released 10 years ago um, here at this workshop um, that we, I think that was the, maybe the first year we were here in Golden. Um, this is a map of downloads over about the past year. You'll notice that uh, we have a lot of downloads within uh, North America, Europe, as well as Asia, and occasionally we get uh, downloads from the Southern Hemisphere as well with um, Charles promoting heavily, heavy use Maybe our greatest use per capita is in New Zealand. Um, uh, and so the, the types of problems that Pileth is really targeting in terms of uh, modeling capabilities is associated with inner seismic deformation, co-seismic stress changes and fault slip, and post-seismic relaxation of the crust. These are all quasi-static modeling associated with earthquakes. It also has dynamic modeling capabilities associated with earthquakes. I, this is my primary research area, modeling strong ground motions and uh, rupture dynamics. Uh, we still look at co-seismic stress changes, but now we also look at the static as well as dynamic stress changes. Um, and in terms of the spontaneous rupture, we're really trying to understand the relationship between ground motions and ground rupture and fault rupture and stress changes and so forth. Pilot can also be used in volcanic deformation modeling. Um, we have one example in our 3D Hex8 examples that shows how you can simulate a dike opening. Um, you can also create uh, the geometry of magma chambers and inflate them. Um, and so you might, so you can investigate various mechanisms of deformation associated with volcanoes. Uh, Pilot is really geared towards the physics part of uh, sort of the whole research problem workflow. And uh, in this setting, uh, you generally, uh, you'll do most of your modeling over here under the physics, but the process of the, of the workflow starts way back with some idea of the geologic structure. Um, sometimes you will use an entirely separate software for trying to model the, the geologic structure. Some of the programs that are out there in the community are GoCAD and Earth Vision, both of, the, both of those are commercial codes um, heavily developed with heavy influence by the oil industry. Um, then when it becomes to mesh generation, um, there is our currently two mechanisms for generate meshes, qubit trellis um, are well, we generally the same. Uh, qubit is the federal US government agency versions uh, that used to all be qubit back when we started these workshops. They spun off the sort of academic commercialization of Qubit into something called Trellis. Um, and of, unfortunately, it now costs money when before it used to be just a small license fee. Um, but we found that this is sort of the, has the lowest learning curve, most easily accessible, uh, has a GUI interface for doing the solid modeling. Um, LeGrit we used back when we started these tutorials. It was developed at Los Alamos by Carl Gable. Um, it has not really undergone much development in about the last, say, five to six years, or maybe even longer. Um, it has a much steeper learning curve. There's no GUI interface. 
um, but we can interface. Um, we well, PyLeft does interface with that. Um, at times, uh, TetGen was another sort of open source mesh generation tool, and sort of the most promising, perhaps newcomer on the list is uh, software called GMesh, developed uh, primarily in France, um, and we are. Uh, uh, already starting to figure out exactly the best way to interface with that. So if you don't want to pay for Qubit or Trellis, then your best option is start learning GMesh and the interface um, will be coming soon. And perhaps if you work with us, we'll be able to uh, get that interface working even faster with people contributing how to uh, generate meshes, particularly regenerating meshes in, that we have done in Qubit and Trellis in the examples and using GMesh. I will say, I'll just add to that, that probably if you're going to go get something, get open cascade, don't get GMesh as a part because that's a whole CAD model. And then for, on the physics code side of things, we have Pyloth and Relax developed by CIG. JPL um, has a code called GeoFest. I don't know if it's still under development. Um, it was when we started these series of workshops. If you want to go the commercial route, Abacus can do a lot of the things that Pyleth can do. Um, and then for visualizations, there's all sorts of open source tools. We primarily use Paraview just because it has an a easy learning curve um, graphical user interface. Visit is also a, a tool that reads pretty much all the same formats that Paraview does. Um, if you use MATLAB heavily, you can access Pyloth output through HDF5 directly into MATLAB. Um, if you're just getting started, we would, I would suggest using Python instead of MATLAB. This gives you access to things like matplotlib, which has basically all the functionality of MATLAB, um, and, it's, and it's free, open source. And uh, if you're using GMT, we don't directly support GMT because of our 3D sort of unstructured mesh modeling focus within Pyloth, but Relax does interface with GMT. So now moving on to a little more of the physics and guts of Pyloth. Uh, the Pyloth version two solves the elasticity equation written here uh, in index notation. I've included the elasticity term with the density times the acceleration. We have Neumann boundary conditions with tractions on the uh, boundaries. We have prescribed displacements. And then if we have a fault, uh, we specify the relative displacement across that fault in some orientation being equal to a, uh, the slip vector. Uh, in terms of our finite element formulation, we take the strong form here in equation one, we multiply by a weighting function and integrate that over the volume and set that equal to zero. And our goal is to decide what the coefficients are related to this variation. After some algebra and, and applying the divergence theorem, we are able to pull out, uh, you'll notice there's now a, a gradient in our um, weighting function. We also have our boundary conditions in terms of our tractions. We have our body force. Uh, we still have our described, prescribed displacements and then our inertial term. Pyleth discretizes the domain into uh, what are known as finite elements. In 2D, these are triangles or quadrilaterals. In 3D, they are quadrilaterals or tetrahedra. Um, you may be familiar with uh, sort of the general philosophy of uh, finite elements where you take a triangle, you have nodes, um, you have edges. Um, well, let me start down here at the bottom where we have just the nodes and the cells or elements. And uh, sort of scrolls off the bottom of the screen. Um, but what you see is that we'll, we take our entire domain divided up in a bunch of triangles and then uh, each triangle has nodes and we describe the variation of the uh, displacement field within the cell uh, to perform the numerical integration. And so there is an inherent topology associated with these fine elements. In finite difference, you have a grid that is logically rectangular um, and it's very easy to know who your neighbors are. In finite elements, we have unstructured grids. And so you have to sort of have an indexing scheme to keep track of this element or cell. This triangle has these nodes, the coordinates of those nodes are so forth. Um, 
And uh, within PyLith, instead of just keeping track of the triangles and nodes, we actually keep track of the triangles, the edges of those triangles, and the vertices. Um, in 3D, we keep track of the solid 3D cell, the faces of that cell, the edges on those faces, and then the vertices on those edges. And so you end up with this complex topology of vertices, edges, cells, um, and in 3D, vertices, edges, faces, and cells. And to the user, this uh, generally isn't important, but it gives you an understanding of some of the error message you might see um, and sort of how you go from a fine element mesh um, to the 3D numerical model. The general overview of the pilot workflow is we generate our fine element mesh using a variety of uh, different packages. You can also create in, uh, a very simple mesh by hand in a simple ASCII file format. We take the output of the various mesh generators and directly read them into Pyleth. No translators are needed for the supported uh, pack packages and mesh generators we support. You also, in addition to your mesh, you need the simulation parameters. And generally, these are divided up into two categories. There are the parameter files that we give an extension .cfg. Um, this is uh, the same format as some configuration file formats, and that's where the CFG comes from. And then uh, in, for a lot of our materials, boundary conditions, and so forth, we specify any spatial variation parameters in what we call spatial databases. These we give the suffix .spatialdb to to identify that they are a spatial database and are different from our parameters. And we'll discuss when we use various types of spatial databases and how these are related to the parameters as we go through the examples. So it's, to run Pilot, you generally need your fine element mesh, your parameters, and your spatial databases. You can then run Pilot, um, and the output uh, in all the examples we'll cover uh, over the next two days, we use HDF5 files. These are, bin are binary files that can be written in parallel. Um, the, by writing in binary and in parallel, it's much, much faster, orders of magnitude faster than ASCII VTK files. Um, some of our previous examples we've done in, in VTK, but um, that not, does not scale up well when you're doing a real research problem. Um, and then we will vi uh, view these HDF5 files in pair view. Um, these HDF5 files are also directly accessible from Python with a package called H5Py, which is included in the binary distribution as well as directly from MATLAB. Pilot you should view as a hierarchy of components. Um, so you start out with basically the entire simulation as a single component. It has subcomponents. Those subcomponents have their own subcomponents and so forth. This uh, is how we separate the mod modularity of Pilot and sort of how we separate one fault type from another, different materials, so you should, you should think of each material as its own component. It has its properties and so forth um, that are subcomponents of uh, that material. Um, in most of our components, uh, Pyleth is written at the very top level in Python. And so we gather all user input uh, via the parameter file, which is read in, uh, in Python. Uh, it's a very flexible, uh, computing language um, that is very user-friendly as well as uh, allows us to do uh, very high, um, high level operations without a lot of code. Um, it also uh, uh, has dynamic typing so we can do swapping on fly at runtime um, rather than having to have that all built in to the compilation. However, Python is not very good for serious number crunching. So all of that is done in C and C++ um, at what we sort of call the computation engine level. The user does not interact with the C and C++. And we use a tool called SWIG that, to provide an interface directly between the C++ and the Python. The parameter files have a relatively simple con uh, syntax. Here at the top, you always have your headers in uh, square brackets. Uh, Comments are the pound sign, just like a shell script. And then we have uh, basically a component equals value or parameter equals value syntax for every different setting. And so here's an example for our mesh generator. 
we're going to tell it the type of reader we are using. In this case, it's the reader for qubit or trellis. Um, and then we need that reader needs a file name. So we specify the file name and then the coordinate system. We're in 2D, so we need to uh, clarify that that's different than the default. Um, so the syntax in the manual, as well as um, in a lot of the examples we'll show, um, generally, well, the square brackets will be in one color. If it's a facility, it'll be in, in blue. If it's a, just a simple parameter value, like a text string, integer value, floating point value, then it gets assigned in purple. So when you see something in blue, that's sort of more of an, you're assigning an object or a sub, -obj or a sub component to a component. Um, and then the what purple, that's generally just these simple parameter values, such as strings and integers. Um, uh, there is within uh, the version pilot 2.2 and later, we have included a graphical parameter viewer that you can run directly on uh, your machine. It's in the uh, parameters GUI directory and you simply uh, start up the parameter viewer. It'll give you a uh, URL to plug into your browser. You plug it into your browser um, and that'll uh, upload it'll start the the page um and uh basically then you load in the parameters and so let me give you a very quick demo of that uh, i'll use the binary so it'll be exactly uh what you see on your screen Yes. So I go to parameters GUI. I start up a parameter viewer, point my web browser to this local address cut and paste and I have now have a GUI interface I can choose the file um, let's see I can probably find Here's one. So on the left-hand side, let's first collapse everything. So at the very top level, we have, let's zoom in a little bit. We have an application. Then within application, we have information about a launcher. It's launching an, an MPI job in parallel. It has ability to dump parameters, a mesh generator, Petsy for our solvers. Uh, it can interface directly with job schedulers on clusters. So there's information about a job scheduler problem. This is where our physics is. Um, and so within the problem, we have normalization, uh, non-dimensionalization of the problem, boundary conditions, interfaces, checkpointing, which is not enabled, gravity field, materials, formulation. And so here is our wedge. If we click on any of these components on the left-hand side, we see all of the information for that component on the right hand side um, it says where it was set from so in this case it was set from a file mat underscore elastic dot cfg it tells you the line number of that file so if you run a simulation and you can't figure out where it got that parameter open up the the parameters file and you can actually find that component and see where it says it's getting its value. You may have accidentally overwritten that value um, later in, in one of your .cfg files. It also gives you the properties, the type of uh, value that it's expecting, the current value, uh, description, and where it was set that value from. Facilities and components 
So within my wedge, you'll see that I have a subcomponent db initial state. So I see that subcomponent. I can see what it's configurable as. Um, and uh, then I can click down here and sort of see what its values are. You'll notice here that uh, it has the full path. So this is the information generally I would post within my parameter file. So that's how you can go from where you are in the hierarchy to know how you get that full path to put uh, in your parameter file. So experiment with the GUI interface. You can't change parameters from this GUI interface yet, um, but you can view all your parameters. And we think this is a much significant improvement over what we had before, which was just generation of a text file. There's also a tab here called version. Um, that specifies all of the version information. It specifies when you ran this, pram this simulation, that's the timestamp here. Um, it says what your operating system was, what version of the operating system you were using, what version of Pilot you were using, um, and as well as all the dependencies. So, uh, choose file. How do you run the first thing? Do to go to parameters GUI within the binary, um, or there, there's a separate, for those of you using the development version, building it yourself, there's a separate uh, tarball for the GUI. Um, and, uh, but the, the version tab is very helpful uh, for us when we're trying to diagnose problems on your end, um, as well as the parameters. And that's why sending us, instead of sending your .cfg files, we want you to send us this JSON file with all of the parameters um, that you have. Um, so there was a question. Um, no logic chain simple issue. That means you're missing part of your Python. You're going to have to use like pip or something. So, well, no, it means that he's not using the Python that was distributed with Pyleth, I think. Oh, yeah, they're not using Python. Um, so we'll have to. Uh, well, we can deal with uh, issues like that um, uh, at the break. Uh, any other general questions about the parameter viewer? Okay, so we'll go back to slides. So uh, the next item I want to discuss is spatial databases. Um, and we'll, as we go through the examples, we will, have a dis we will discuss and describe specific cases of why we chose a particular type of spatial database so you can understand the reasoning um, and the differences between them. Uh, and so here I'm just going to cover what are they and what do they um, generally sort of how we, the context of how we use them. So a very simple parameter uh, spatial database is, say we have a uniform value for a displacement on a boundary condition. Um, that would be a uniform value, and we would generally call that a zero dimension spatial database because we can specify that value by a single point. Uh, in another case, we may have a Neumann boundary conditions where we're specifying tractions on the boundary, and we want to have a linear variation of, of that boundary condition or the, of those tractions. And so we may use a spatial database that would give us a piecewise linear variation of the tractions for a normal boundary condition. Because we have a piecewise linear variation, we can specify that with points along a line, and so we call that a 1D spatial database. Now in 3D, things can get very complicated, and we may have a particular customized spatial database for things like seismic velocity models. So there is an interface within Pilot for accessing um, a relatively old version of the SCEC CVMH um, version 5.3 that makes use of how that model was put together to do very fast optimized interrogations for the seismic velocity models. The advantage of spatial databases is that they are generally independent of the discretization of the problem. You can go regenerate your mesh, generate it as a different resolution, change uh, sort of the, uh, the type of cell you're using. And your spatial database, which describes the spatial variation of your, say, 
parameters along a boundary can stay the same. So this makes it very flexible in terms of as you decide to change and fine tune your discretization, you can keep your spatial database the same. Likewise, you can fine tune your spatial variation to match the physics that you want without having to change your mesh. Some of the types of spatial databases that are, very, uh, that are available um, are the uniform database. This is optimized for a uniform value. We use this quite a bit in the examples that we'll discuss. A simple database, this is an arbitrary distribution of points for variations in 0D, 1D, 2D, and 3D. So we don't make any assumptions about uh, the topology of these points, whether it's a uniform grid, circular grid, anything like that, polar coordinates, anything like that, um, except whether they are either a point, a line on a surface, or, ran or distributed in 3D. The disadvantage of not making any, having any assumptions or constraints on that is that it can be, it becomes quite expensive to do uh, queries of the spatial database in, for very large numbers of points in 2D or 3D. Um, so we have a simple grid database where you have information on a logical grid. It does not need to be a uniform grid. Um, so you can have spaced, irregularly spaced points, but they must, must be along the coordinate axes of, I have values at, every, of, at these coordinates in the X direction, another set of coordinates in the Y direction, another set of coordinates in the Z direction if it's 3D. The advantage of that is we can do a bilinear search on each coordinate direction independently and do linear interpolation um, of the points at that grid point very, very fast. So this is uh, orders of magnitude faster in 3D compared to the simple database. Uh, the Skek velocity model is another spatial database. And then we have a specialized spatial database when we want to specify zero uh, displacement boundary conditions. We use this often enough that instead of even specifying a uniform, displace, uniform database with zero values, you can just, the default is a zero displacement database for Dirichlet boundary conditions. Um, so you don't even have to specify that it's zero. It's just deep, zero by default. Uh, this is the design of Pilot. So up here at the top, we have our sort of geodynamics codes, um, specific physics. Then we depend on PETSI for all of our linear algebra solvers, parallel uh, processing data structures. Spatial data is a package that's uh, basically I maintain in combination with Pilot that has all the spatial database information. It relies on PROJ for geographic projections. Uh, we'll make use of that in our 3D uh, uh, subduction zone example. There's also PIR, which is how we gather all the user input. That's the .cfg files. Um, we depend on the popular Python NumPy package. Petsy um, uses HDF5. Uh, Pilot uses NetCDF for reading uh, qubit and trellis files. NetCDF depends on HDF5, which depends on MPI. So back here, down here in the, the red, we have a sort of a very low level, things like blast laypack for number crunching, MPI for parallel processing. So we have sort of a relatively complex hierarchy of dependencies. This is one reason why you don't build the software yourself. We give you the binary package. And if you need to build it for use on a cluster, we provide an installer, which starts at the bottom and works its way to the top, building all of uh, the software that you need to run Pilot. Uh, within Pilot, uh, we follow CIG best uh, practices for software development. All of the code is under version control within GitHub. Uh, new features are added in, special, in separate branches. That allows us to do things like develop version 3 while we're uh, still working on version 2.2 and adding in new features that are included in the sort of the stable branch of the code. Uh, we use uh, the CFG files provide relatively user-friendly specification of the parameters at runtime. We do post our development plan on the wiki so you can always see what is up and coming and how we're making progress. Um, we do make progress, even though some things on there have been on there for a number of years. Um, and uh, portability, um, Pilot builds on almost any Unix flavored operating system. Um, and you can build both optimized and debugging versions um, from the same source code. And we have extensive documentation and hopefully we have an understandable user workflow. Uh, 
Um, you can display version information always by running pyloth dash dash version or looking at that parameter file. Uh, some of the tools we use in development, GitHub, as I've already mentioned, uh, we document within the code. We use sort of the Doxygen context for documenting all the parameters. Uh, our C++ unit tests use a, a package called CPP unit. Uh, anytime we check in code into uh, the repository, uh, a test suite is automatically runs on the Travis continuous integration in the cloud that tells us whether our tests that we've developed passed or not. Um, and then to see how well our tests actually um, sort of cover the entire range of code, we use additional sort of uh, tools to measure how well our tests, um, what lines of the code are being tested by the tests and which ones uh, still need tests written for them. Uh, we test at various levels. We have unit tests that are at the sort of the scale of a function. So when we write a function, there is a test that tests to make sure that function does what we want it to do. Um, we also do full scale tests. That is, we run, uh, we have a, sort of a test uh, structure set up where within our test, it'll run a bunch of simulations and it checks the output against analytical solutions. Some of those tests are even run in parallel so that we verify both that the serial version and parallel versions are running properly. And then we have benchmarks. These are more sort of physics based. There may not be an analytical solution, but we want to test things for comparing against other codes, looking at serial uh, and parallel um, variations and scaling in, the, in parallel and so forth. Uh, so now um, I'm starting to run out of time. So I'll just quickly go over um, some of the features in the current release. Um, we have time integrations and elasticity formulations for, those, for both infinitesimal strain and small strain. Um, for dynamic problems, we also include numerical damping via, via an artificial viscosity. Our bulk constitutive models, we have all the same models in 2D and 3D. We cover elastic, linear Maxwell viscoelastic, a generalized Maxwell viscoelastic model that you can make various sort of perturbations of viscoelastic models thing from using, by adjusting the parameters, you can create Berger's body uh, viscoelastic models. We also have a parallel visco, power law viscoelastic model, a drucker prager elastoplastic model. Our boundary and interface conditions, we have a relatively general formulation for time dependence in our Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions, as well as uh, our point forces. Um, we have prescribed slip fault interfaces where we can do multiple ruptures. We'll show an example of that later today. Tomorrow we'll talk about dynamic fault interfaces. Um, we can handle fault interfaces with T intersections. We'll discuss that this afternoon. Uh, and gravitational body forces. For fault constitutive models, we have static friction, linear slip weakening, linear time weakening, and uh, Dietrich Arena rate and state friction with the aging law. Uh, we have a relatively simple time stepping via either automatically selected if you're using things like the parallel viscoelastic model. Uh, you can also do user controlled or a uniform time step. Uh, user controlled is if you know something's happening and you need fighter discretization at certain time steps, you can actually control that. If you know a priori when you need those finer time steps. I've discussed the various ways we import meshes, output uh, in VTK and HDF5. You can do over the entire volume of the domain, over a surface boundary, over interpolated to specific points, such as GPS or seismic stations, where the file walls can also include in the output the station names. Um, the state variables, we can also output for every single material. That stress strain for the viscoelastic models, it can be the viscous stresses. The fault information includes things like slip, slip rate, tractions, um, as well as any of the uh, state variables for a friction model. And we'll, we won't spend too much time covering state variables in our, uh, in our sort of examples, but we'll cover most of these others quite extensively. We do automatic conversion of all units for parameters within uh, Pyleth, and we non-dimensionalize everything. So if, if you are working at a scale that is very different from the default, which is basically sort of the kilometer uh, in length scale and time and one year in a time scale, um, you need to be very careful 
that you adjust those parameters accordingly. We've had people model laboratory size samples of faulting um, that are on sort of this size. And if you use the, the default length scales of a kilometer, um, things the solver really has a, can have a tough time deal, we, dealing with non-dimensionalized values that are orders of magnitude different than the, uh, the default length scale. So be careful of that. Also, the time scale is clearly not one second or even a year. It's generally a millisecond when you're dealing with laboratory size sampling, samples. Uh, we have par parallel unifying global refinement. So you can generate your mesh at one resolution and then uh, Pilot can automatically refine that mesh by a factor of two or four. Um, at runtime, after is distributed in parallel. This allows you to run problems that are order of magnitude size bigger than what you've generated the mesh for. Um, we use Petsy for our linear and nonlinear solvers. Um, and there are, uh, we write out that progress of the simulation in a file um, that, I'll sh that we'll show in the examples that uh, based on how many time steps it's already covered, it gives you an estimated, it tells you what percent of time steps it's run as well as an estimated time of when the simulation will be complete. Um, let's see. Was I supposed to go to 9 or 9.15? Okay. Uh, let's see. I'll quickly cover the faults. <laughs> and we'll come back to, we can come back to this this afternoon when this probably will make more sense. Um, so when you generate your mesh, you do not explicitly, you create geometry with the fault in there, but you do not create sort of this, what we call the cohesive cells that are associated with the tractions and the slip on the fault. Um, and what, uh, when we model the fault, we have a displace, we have a discontinuity in the displacement, um, and then uh, equal and opposite tractions on the two sides. Uh, and for any given fault surface, we always have a normal direction that differentiates what we call the positive side from the negative side, where our convention is that the normal, whichever direction it was selected, always points to the positive side of the fault. Um, so when you make your mesh, you will mark the vertices that correspond to that interface within in the interior of your mesh. If your, me if your fault all extends all the way to the fault surface, you, uh, you do not need to do anything special at, uh, at the free surface. However, if your mesh, if your fault ends within your mesh, you also need to mark that last point, um, that last point on the fault, that that's what we call the buried edge. In 2D, it's sort of a buried point. Um, this is a very simple mesh of just sort of two strips of triangles on each side of the fault. We've marked the fault with the blue vertices and the uh, edge vertex in green. What Pilot does at runtime is uh, it's, it will split that mesh. So you'll have your original vertices shown here in blue, and it'll create new cells on the positive side of the fault, it'll add new vertices, and then in between it adds what we call cohesive cells. These are zero area, zero volume cells that we uh, use these as sort of the bookkeeping to handle the entire fault implementation. Um, and uh, once you've inserted these new vertices and sort of cells right along the interface, then we need to mark which sides of our, tri which triangles belong to which side, and then we can update what we call sort of the connections of those triangles so that this triangle here on the right side instead of having the original blue vertex it now has a red vertex where the fault was so these fault so these cells outside the fault know nothing about the fault um, and all of the fault implementation is characterized by what happens in these zero volume zero zero area cells which i've shown being slightly separated when in reality, these two vertices, the, each corresponding pair of red and blue vertices, they have the same coordinates. But, and so this whole sort of split is collapsed down onto a single surface. Um, this is how we do this is uh, discussed in a JGR paper that was published in 2013. Um, and you can see that for more information or ask. It's also discussed quite a bit in the manual. Um, on that fault interface, we have equal and opposite uh, tractions. We use the Lagrange multipliers for that. So that's why 
And one side, of the, the positive side of the fault, we have a negative term. On the negative side of the fault, we have a positive term. That's because they're equal and opposite. And it looks much like a Neumann traction boundary condition that we have on our exterior boundary. On the relative displacements, uh, there are constraint equation of the slip minus the relative displacement should be equal to zero. And when we add this into sort of our nominal AU equals B, um, we end up for the Lagrange multiplier degrees of freedom, a zero on the diagonal and these constraint uh, off diagonal entries. Um, this complicates the solve, but we have developed uh, solver settings that take this into account and provide a good optimization. Um, sort of already discussed that. So Charles will um, talk about meshing. Um, some of the main things to emphasize are there's no silver bullet when it comes to fine element mesh generation. That's one reason why we cover it in these tutorials to give you an understanding of what we use when we generate a mesh. Um, and in many cases, there are multiple ways to do it. Uh, the way that's presented is generally what we have found, what we think works best after uh, now probably two decades of experience um, with probably, we've been using Qubit and Trellis for over 10 years now, so we know what Qubit and Trellis does well. Um, that may change as we start to use additional mesh generators. Um, when you have a 2D or 3D problem, you need to decide what shape of cell you want to use. Um, hexes and quads are slightly more accurate and faster. However, tets and triangles handle complex geometry much better. And you'll see that in the meshing example. Um, I think Charles will go over the tetrahedral version. There's also a script in the binary distribution that shows the hexahedral version. Um, uh, you should check and double check your mesh. Problems you encounter running the pilot simulation may be nothing to do with pilot itself, but the mesh you used um, to generate, the, the, the mesh you used to run pilot. So things, when you run the mesher, look, are there any error messages? Um, make sure that your boundaries are marked the way you think they were marked, um, and be sure to check mesh quality. Um, we've got, we generally get several inquiries per year about people having trouble running pilot, and um, in sort of a significant fraction of those, we find that their mesh has very poor quality cells that is ruining their ability to converge to a solution. Uh, we'll discuss that later. Uh, we'll discuss topography, bathymetry. Um, uh, Charles will talk a little bit about that. Um, general tips, start in 2D if at all possible. The reason for this is you end up with a much smaller problem and there's a much faster turnaround time between running a simulation, looking at the output, making changes, and rerunning the simulation. Um, 2D also gives you a lot more ability to sort of experiment with the meshing um, because the meshing process itself doesn't take as long. Um, however, you need to keep in mind that the physics you want to look at in 3D may not uh, there may not be a good 2D analog. So coming up with the proper 2D analog can be important. Um, in either 2D or 3D, start with a coarse resolution. Do not try and generate a mesh spanning thousands of kilometers at a one meter resolution, even if that's where you want to eventually get. Um, uh, and the problem, you know, don't try and run on a thousand cores on a, on a cluster when you can understand the physics and get an idea of how to set up the problem using your desktop machine or even your laptop with uh, one core. And so our 3D subduction zone, generally the problems run less than a minute, even a few minutes. And you'll see that you can actually look at a fair amount of physics um, running on your laptop when yes, when we, you final research grade problem, you're gonna want it a higher resolution, finer resolution mesh, um, more time step, finer discretization. Um, you do need to recognize that sort of the resolution depends on the scale of your boundary conditions. If you have uniform boundary conditions, you know, look at what scales of, do you have in your problem? Are your materials properties varying on short length scales or long length scales? Are your faults on long length scales or short length scales? Um, and use your tuition and think about analogous solutions. Am I squeezing a box? What should happen when I squeeze a box? Um, you know, don't throw out all of the theory and just because you're running a numerical model. 
Um, because you can use that intuition and experience you have to get much faster along um, in your modeling. Uh, so I think I've covered everything. Um, any questions on that sort of quick, brief overview, hopefully giving you the big picture of Pyleth um, and some of the things you'll we'll be covering in the later sessions. <laughs>